Hello everybody, my name is Jay. I'm one of the expert OET teachers here at E2 Language. Welcome to my bedroom. In this lesson, I'm gonna take you through writing, OET writing very deeply, and I'm gonna show you all the ins and outs of the criteria, that is the checklist that the examiners use to mark your writing. I'm gonna give you heaps and heaps of tips on how to improve your score and really try and get the highest score possible in OET. Okay, here we go. It's gonna be a bit of a sort of lecture style format. I don't want you to or expect you to memorize everything I'm going to show you uh, because it's too much. What I'm gonna do is go through everything the examiners go through when they're looking at your writing, okay? Because at the end of the day, end of the day that's what matters. You wanna write your letter so the examiner is happy with it. And there's a lot going on there. In short, this is what they're going to be looking at. They're going to be looking at the assessment criteria and level descriptors, okay? This goes for every OET test around the world. It is marked the same way, okay? And you can think about it like this. Here's your examiner. The examiner will be looking at your letter and the examiner will be referencing this table in front of you, okay? That's how they arrive at the score that you get, okay? And just for your interest, before we get started, if you do want to get a B, that's a score between 350 and 440, or the equivalent of an IELTS 7 to 7.5, you're going to need to get two out of three for purpose, minimum, and five out of seven for all the other criteria, which we're going to look at in depth in this lesson, okay? So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a really good idea about how it all works, about how you need to write your letter, but again, this isn't to be memorized. This is just to be sort of, just listen up, listen carefully. This is what is going to be helpful when you get feedback, especially if you get feedback from one of the E2 language teachers, because we mark according to this as well. Okay, so how are you scored? Well, you're scored on six criteria, six things. First one is called purpose, and you'll get a score of zero, one, two, or three for purpose, okay? You're then scored on content, conciseness and clarity, genre and style, organization and layout, and language. And each of those are scored from zero to seven. So we're gonna go through all of these one by one. And let's first focus on purpose. All right, I forget why I put this slide here, but oh no, I remember now, that's right. We're going to use this model letter. So this is a model letter from e2language.com. Um, I'll just mention that if you're a free user uh, or, or watching this on YouTube, you can go across and actually get one full free practice test on e2language.com, including this letter. So we're gonna use this one as our basis. And this is really is a perfect letter. You can't get A plus in OET, but this would be the equivalent of an A plus letter. It is spot on in every which way. So we're gonna use this to look at the scoring and uh, hopefully work out how you can do the same. So, the first part of purpose, if we break it down and look carefully at it, is that the purpose of your letter is immediately apparent, okay? The purpose of your letter is immediately apparent. Let's go back to the, uh, to, whoops, where am I? To this part here. Now, have a look up, but right at the top, you can see the date, then you can see the name of the recipient, the address, you can see the uh, salutation, dear Miss Pasquale, you can see the re and then the patient's name and the age of the patient. The next sentence here that says, Mr. Chien requires your professional assistance for his ongoing difficulties with mobility following recent surgery. This is what the purpose is. It's the first sentence or the first paragraph sentences of your letter, okay? So this is marked separately to everything else. It is this part here and you'll get zero, one, two or three points for it. So let me go back to it. So the purpose of your letter, that little bit I just showed you, has to be immediately apparent. I'll read you this one again. Imagine that you're the recipient of this letter, okay? You don't know anything about Mr. Chien. You've just picked up the letter and you've read this first paragraph and it says, Mr. Chien requires your professional assistance for his ongoing difficulties with mobility following recent surgery. That's immediately apparent. It's like, okay, cool. I don't know any of the details yet, but just from a single sentence or perhaps two sentences you might write, I'm very aware of what's going on here. 
Okay, now there's another part of purpose. Okay, let's call it 1B. That is the purpose of your letter is sufficiently expanded. So you've got that first paragraph or sentence. The second paragraph needs to expand upon that first part. It needs to flesh it out, extrapolate. So let's read the second part here. Mr. Chien was admitted to St. Andrew's Hospital two days ago with swelling and fluid buildup in his right knee, the result of a total knee replacement, which he underwent on the 6th of the 8th, 2020, due to osteoarthritis. The resulting pain and swelling have severely limited his mobility. Consequently, his self-care activities have been significantly compromised. So you got 1A, where you write that first little part, which briefly uh, tells the reader what's happening. Then in the secondary par the second paragraph they're following, you expand upon that with details from the case notes to give a, a bigger picture of what's going on. By the way, if you have any questions while I'm ranting here, please pop them into the chat and we'll get to them at the end, but I'll continue on. So if we look back at that table of criteria that the examiners reference or look at while they're marking your letter, we can see there purpose, see that column, and right at the top, if you get three points, it says purpose of document is immediately apparent and sufficiently expanded as required. Okay, great. We've just done that. So we're so far, we're at a hundred percent with our letter. Let's now move off of purpose and onto content. Okay. You also need to keep this in mind. Okay. Content. So let's break up content. Content, 2A, the content of your letter is appropriate to your intended reader. So in the letter that we're looking at here, or the case notes, let's have a look at the writing task. And this writing task is just critical to your success. The first thing you should do on test day in the reading time is skip the case notes. Don't even bother about those. Go straight to the writing task because you need to determine who you're writing to and why. So the writing task is critically important. Uh, the, uh, so we're writing, we're, we need to write our letter to a specific person. We need to keep that person in mind as we write our letter. In this case, we're writing to a physiotherapist, okay? Why are we writing to her? We're, well, we're writing to her regarding Mr. Chien's rehabilitation, okay? So keep that in mind, that's 2A. 2B, the content of your letter addresses what is needed to continue care. Okay, so in the letter, uh, we talked about the purpose statement. You got the purpose statement right at the top, yeah? You will also, you will most likely, if not always, I won't say it 100%, but if nearly always, you're going to have a request paragraph at the end. The request paragraph is going to ask the reader of your letter to do something, okay? So in this case, rehabilitation. Let's read this. It says, kindly provide acute and comprehensive rehabilitation of Mr. Chien's right knee, okay? This is the only request that I needed to make of this physiotherapist, okay? So a lot of people, what they wanna do when they write these letters is they wanna memorize a structure. You know, they want to have, okay, so Jay, it's, it's purpose. And then I put medical background and then I put medication, medical diagnosis here. Is it always this structure? The answer is there is no st set structure to any of these letters. You need to be flexible. Okay. The only thing you can really count on besides the address and the dear doctor, blah, blah, and your sincerely in your name. The only thing you can count on is the purpose statement and the request paragraph. Okay. Everything in between that depends on the task and the case notes that you have. So please don't memorize a structure because it won't work well. Let's read this 2B again though. The content of your letter addresses what is needed to continue care. It says in brackets there, key information is included, no important details missing. So uh, let me talk about this a little bit. When you're selecting case notes, okay, there will be additional case notes there that are unnecessary. They're like distractors. They're put in there to distract you and you should not be tempted by them. You should not include them in your letter because you will actually lose points if you include irrelevant case notes. Now, one of the um, 
problems that you might have is you might look at a case note and go, hmm, should I include it? Shouldn't I include it? It kind of might be important. If it might be important, put it in. Because what's worse is to not include an important case note, okay? It's better to include something that's potentially irrelevant than to exclude or leave out something that's really relevant, okay? So if you're umming and ahhing, go, you know what? I'm gonna pop it in just in case. Cool, to see. The content of your letter accurately represents the case notes. So this is about misinterpretation. So let's look at these case notes here. It says discharge plan. In fact, let me get my uh, mount. Whoa, sorry. Let me move my, get my little pointer. So you know what I'm looking at here. Da, 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 da. Come on, pointer, where are you? Zoom's doing funny things today. All right, cool. Now I can move, use this. Okay, so look at these set of case notes about the discharge plan. So discharge plan, patient discharged home with family assistance, regular diet as tolerated, needs acute comprehensive rehabilitation, patient has front wheel walker. So look at this sentence or these sentences and look at the misinterpretation here and the misrepresentation of the case notes. Mr. Chen's family will accompany, accompany him to his nursing home. Please note that he is not tolerating his regular diet. In addition to some rehabilitation, he also requires a front wheel walker. In other words, this is just wrong. It's just wrong. It doesn't say that here. It doesn't say that this is a misinterpretation. So make sure you interpret the case notes correctly. Cool, that was content. Um, just some key takeaways from content. Well, the one big takeaway from content is relevance, okay? You need to select relevant case notes. How do you know if it's relevant? Again, it depends on who you're writing to and why, which comes from the task. So just really keep that in mind. Okay, let's talk about conciseness and clarity because you are scored on this or these criteria from zero to seven as well. And we wanna maximize our scores. Okay, so 3A. The length of your letter is appropriate to the case and reader, okay? Also in brackets there, it says no irrelevant information included, no relevant information excluded. We touched on this in content as well. But really what this is talking about is, uh, let's just think about it as the length of your letter. And a, and, a, and a good little way to think about this is, if you have included relevant information and you've excluded irrelevant information, the body of your letter should equal about 180 to 200 words. That is, if you've expanded upon those uh, case notes and written them into sentences, etc. If you've selected appropriately, you're going to end up with a letter that's about 180 to 200 words long. Okay, that's just how that works. And that's how they design these case notes. So if you end up with a letter that's 250 words, you've probably included irrelevant, too much irrelevant information. Or what's worse is if you end up with a letter that's like 150 or 120 words long, you have probably excluded important information that should be in there and it should be a bit longer and a bit bulkier. Now, it's talking here about the body of the letter being 180 to 200 words. What does that mean? Well, if you look here in red, that's the body of the letter. So not the date, not the address, not the sort of formal elements of the letter, dear Miss Pasquale, re George Chien, and the yours sincerely nurse. Everything from the purpose to the uh, sign off here um, is the body of your letter that should be between 180 and 200 words. Now, OET are not particularly strict with word count. It's not like an IELTS test. In an IELTS test, if you write below 250 words, boom, your score goes down. Here, it doesn't really work like that. You know, they can sort of be a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, but your aim is to get sort of between that. And this comes from practice. You should really be, you know, while you're practicing, counting the body of your letter just to make sure you're in the ballpark. Hopefully, you're not too low or too high. Okay, next one. Let me just move my little... Uh, sorry, we're still on the same one, 3A. So the length of your letter, no irrelevant information included, no relevant information excluded. Again, depends on this task. The task is critical. 
Okay, 3B, you summarized information effectively. What does that mean? Well, let's have a look at, uh, sorry, I keep getting this Zoom thing on my screen. Let's have a look at these case notes here. Medical background, osteoarthritis, right knee, progressive severe pain, total knee replacement on this particular date. Severe difficulty with mobility, right lower extremity, glandular fever, history of shingles. Okay, so let's eliminate glandular fever and history of shingles um, because they could be considered irrelevant. Um, and let's have a look at whether we summarize this effectively. Okay, tell me, is this paragraph a good summary of this, excluding these because they're not relevant? Mr. Chien was admitted to St. Andrew's Hospital two days ago, 10th of the 8th, 20, with swelling and fluid buildup in his right knee. The result of a total knee replacement, which he underwent on the 8th of the 8th, 2020, due to osteoarthritis. The resulting pain and swelling have severely limited his mobility. Consequently, his self-care activities have been significantly compromised. Okay, nice. So that is a good summary of those case notes there. And in fact, you can't see it, but in this paragraph, I've actually brought in some information from different parts of the case note case notes here, just to sort of um, make this very topical, make it um, very relevant and, and, and a good summary here. So summarizing is really important. And what that means is what you're doing is you're not just taking a case note and writing a sentence, taking this case note, writing another sentence. What you're doing is you might take this case note, this case note, and this case note, and, and synthesize them together into a, two sentences, for example. Right? Or you might just take one case note and expand upon it. It sort of depends on how you do that. It depends how you interpret those case notes. That's what you ought to be doing. Let's get going. 3C, you clearly presented information. Now, again, this is about conciseness and clarity. Clarity is key here. Have a look at the highlighted words in these paragraphs. And let's look at the first paragraph. So we've got during, during Mr. Chien's time in care, the swelling was, was noted, was supervised, was given, he still experiences. So there's an interesting thing going on here with clarity and verb tenses, okay? It's pretty clear that that paragraph is talking about, largely talking about what happened in the past to Mr. Chien. It might've been just yesterday, but it's still in the past, okay? And then it kind of switches in that second paragraph where it says, Mr. Chien is now medically stable and ready for discharge, okay? And then it's got something about the future there, his family who will supervise his self-care activities. So although this is about conciseness and clarity, verb tenses are really uh, critical to your clarity, to making sure that the person reading your letter is understanding that story, okay, of what happened, what's happening now and what will happen. Okay, and that's a clear presentation of information. Okay, in fact, while, while I'm on that, down here in a little bit, we're going to talk about language and we're going to talk about grammar and vocabulary and sentence structure and whatnot. And although it is uh, graded separately as the sixth criteria there, you can see how important it is in other aspects or in other criteria as well. So you can see how the verb tenses, for example, start to come into clarity or sentence structure starts to come into clarity. In fact, let me go back to clarity because I wanna make a point here um, or a distinction about what, what, why OET is very different from other English tests such as IELTS. In IELTS, you are graded highly if you sort of show off your language, if you include a variety of different sentence types and some very uncommon words and stuff like that. OET is very different. OET will grade you more highly if you're clearer. They do not want you to be opaque or um, you know, use, use flowery language or long sentence types and stuff like that. They just want you to get to the point because it's supposed to represent what you do in your workplace, which is someone reading your referral or discharge letter doesn't want to read through a complicated essay. They want to know factually what's happening very quickly. Okay. So focus on clarity, which is a good thing because I think it's um, somewhat easier to write uh, letters like that rather than be 
uh, flowery. Okay, the next one, genre and style. What does this mean? Well, 4A, let's break it down. Your writing is clinical and factual. Again, this sort of goes back to clarity. It's clinical and factual, but it's a little bit different. So take these case notes here. Social background, accountant, alcohol, two to three units socially, non-smoker enjoys watching soccer, walking dog. Okay, this sentence or these sentences are not good. This is bad. This is not clinical and this is not factual. You might be interested to know that Mr. Chien was an accountant. While he drinks quite heavily, which is a major concern, luckily he doesn't smoke. Okay, why is this bad language? Why is this inappropriate for an OET letter? There are a few things going on here. First of all, this this phrase you might be interested to know is just kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's not a very clinical phrase. Um, we've got this, we've got this sort of uh, op opinion here. He drinks quite heavily. I mean, these, these things, opinions ought to be avoided as much as possible in your writing. If you're going to keep it clinical and factual, especially something like this, which is a major concern. Okay, so if, if it's your concern, maybe keep that to yourself and just keep it clinical and, and factual. Where it says, luckily, he doesn't smoke. Um, you know, this again is, is not clinical, clinical language. Okay, you want to keep it as clean as possible. You just want to represent those case notes in a really clear, factual way. Okay, let's continue on. 4B, your writing is appropriate to the reader's discipline and knowledge. So remember, we're writing to a physiotherapist, okay? Now, okay, you might be a, a specialist in, in something else. If you're a, a, a doctor or a radiographer or whatever, you need to consider who you're writing to and make your writing appropriate to their discipline, okay? You don't want to overwhelm somebody with your technical language that you know. It needs to be appropriate for the reader. So for example, if you're writing dear physiotherapist, and then something like below is a very technical description of Mr. Chien's psychological status and needs. Do you think that's appropriate for a physiotherapist who's going to be concentrating more on the physical body or the physical aid, aid of Mr. Chien rather than the psychological or mental aid? So here, this is just an example. It probably won't happen like this, but hopefully that gives you an example. Or let's look at this one here. Let's say you're referring Mr. Chen to a specialist, right? But then in your letter, you write, let me tell you, Mr. Specialist, what's what. Firstly, you need to do this. Secondly, I think you should do that. Okay, that's inappropriate because if you're referring to this patient to a specialist, you should be deferring your uh, uh, understanding to them to make the decision. Again, you're just providing that reader with the facts, with clear facts. Cool. I think that's all clear. Uh, let's continue on. 4C, you used technical terms, abbreviations, and polite language appropriately for the reader. Okay, so technical terms we just talked about, right? So you need to, if you're writing um, to a fellow specialist, fine, use technical terms or, you know, you be the judge of that, but just keep that in mind. Let's talk about abbreviations though. So obviously all around the world, there's different medical abbreviations and there are medical abbreviations which are universal. You know, um, I can't think of any because I'm not a medical professional, but um, BP for blood pressure, for example, I'm pretty sure that's a, a universal one. So if it's a universal abbreviation, it's okay to use that in your letter. If you have something that you use locally in your hospital or in your region or in your country, don't use it, expand it so it's not an abbreviation. And if you're unsure, expand it so it's not an abbreviation. Um, whoops, sorry, this is talking about polite language. So polite language, just have a look at this here. Hello, doc, how are you? It's been a long time since we chatted. How's your family? Well, it looks like Mr. Chien is at it again, the silly duffer. Okay, this is obviously informal, wrong register. It's just, it's not an appropriate way to write 
a letter and any of that sort of stuff is just unnecessary. You don't need to ask how the recipient of the letter is, for example. There are sort of letter conventions or styles that you should follow and all of the model letters on e2language.com are of the highest standard and will allow you to sort of see the, that, that language that you need. Okay, next one, organization and layout. So let's take a look at this. I hope you're doing okay. I'm sort of just, again, I'm just giving you lots of information here. Um, I don't, you don't need to sort of memorize it because I think what will happen is while you're practicing, you'll start to implement it and it'll be much better. Okay, what are we doing? Organization and layout. So the organization needs to be appropriate, logical and clear. Okay, uh, we're going to look closely at paragraph organization in a second because there's sort of two types of organization that we're looking at here. We're looking at macro organization. That is the overall organization of your letter. Make sure you get that right. Okay, that should not be, that should not cost you points. There's just a, you, you just follow the sort of structure here. Okay, date can go right at the top or the date can go um, under the address or it doesn't really matter where you put the date but then it's got the address that you copy from the task it's got dear doctor so and so recipient comma re mr george chien etc this stuff just copy it from the model okay uh, but then you've got a secondary type of organization which is much more complicated and that is the organization of the paragraphs themselves Okay, how are you organizing your paragraphs? You might be able to get the macro organization right, but how do you get that micro organization right? And this, is, this comes down to this part here, 5B, key information is highlighted. Obviously that doesn't mean literally highlighted. You know, you're not using a, um, sorry, I've actually got a highlighter here. You're not using a highlighter to do that. What that means is, key information within the paragraph is prioritized. Okay, that is, if there's something important that you need to say to the reader, push it to the top of the paragraph. Okay, don't leave it at the bottom of the paragraph. And if you think about the macro structure, again, important information should go towards the top of the paragraph. Okay, so think about prioritizing, or another way to say this, highlighting key information. Um, subsections are well organized, that is, paragraphing throughout here, including the purpose up here, the request down here, and the other key bits of information between it. And the overall letter is just uh, well laid out. Let's think for a little minute about different types of paragraph structures, because you can actually categorize different paragraph structures. And this might help you to conceptualize uh, the way that you write the letter. So you can have description paragraphs, for example, um, you'll have the purpose paragraph. Usually the second paragraph there is a description that will go into some detail or, you know, it, it expanding upon what's happened to Mr. Chien. That could be a description paragraph. It could also be a bit of a recount paragraph. A difference between a description and a recount would be a recount sort of tells a bit of a story in terms of timelines. Okay, so with Mr. Chien here, there was just a single date that something happened. So we're describing that. But let's say Mr. Chien had several um, events happened um, with his knee reconstruction. And so we might recount that in a paragraph. And we might say, three weeks ago, Mr. Chien arrived at the hospital, blah, blah, blah. Seven days later, he da, 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 da. And yesterday, he dum, 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 dum. So that's sort of a recounting type of uh, paragraph. Um, you may have to write a recommendation paragraph. It may say something in the task about that. Um, usually you're deferring that as a referral letter to someone else, but it's possible. Uh, a comparison paragraph, you might be comparing something, you know, his first visit to his most recent visit, uh, the effects of the medication compared to the effects of the new medication. Um, again, this will all come from the case notes, but it's a possible paragraph structure. Classification, um, I don't really, actually, I don't think that's going to be appropriate here. You won't have to you don't really have to draw on your medical knowledge at all here. You're really just using the case notes and writing a letter. You're certainly not providing any diagnosis of your own accord or, you know, going back into some sort of medical knowledge that you have. Um, explanation paragraph is certainly possible. And of course, there's the request paragraph, which I didn't put here, which is, um, which will be a part of every letter. So there's, 
different paragraph structures. Okay, we're nearly there. Let's talk about language, okay? Uh, and of course, this really is the backbone of your entire letter because it doesn't matter, you could be the best doctor or nurse in the world, but if you are struggling with fundamental English language skills, ultimately this is an English language test, then that's going to affect your score. So let's have a look at what language means in OET writing. So there's different parts here. One is your overall language use makes meaning clear. Okay, so forget all the little bits of grammar and prepositions and articles and verb tenses. Just overall, your language makes it easy for the reader to understand what's going on. Okay, that's the main aim here, clarity. Your vocabulary is precise. That is, you're using a word for the right reason. Okay, you're using a word at the right time to make the right meaning. Okay, you're not using some abstract word or some word that's not quite, quite appropriate. You're precise with your vocabulary use. Your grammar is accurate. That is, you know, your verb tenses are accurate. You've used a, an article and the noun properly. You've used the right preposition. Uh, plural nouns are important. You know, difference between uh, headache and headaches can be very, can impact the meaning of what you're writing uh, very importantly. Your sentence structures are accurate. Okay, so you don't want to, you want to make sure that you're writing sort of mainly just simple or compound sentences. Uh, you may use a, a, a complex sentence here and there. Uh, there's really no need to make very long sentences. Again, it's about clarity. Uh, your spelling is accurate and your punctuation is accurate. So these are all the elements of language that uh, uh, really, really make up the basis of your letter, okay? All the other stuff is OET, test prep stuff. This stuff is English language. Um, just while I'm here, if you're struggling with these fundamental skills, which maybe you are, um, check out a website that we've created called e2school.com, e2school.com. It's very similar to e2language.com, except it's not test prep. What it is, is it, it has a grammar course, a vocabulary course, there's even a pronunciation course there. And it's very inexpensive, it's like $9 for a course, and it just builds up those fundamental skills. Cool, so at the end of the day, with OET writing, it all depends on these criteria, because as I mentioned, this is what the examiner is referring to when they're looking at your writing. They're, they're going, okay, did she do this? Yes, good, how well? Okay, really well, three points. Did she do this? No, not very well, four points, etc. You wanna maximize each of these, okay? You wanna make that examiner as happy as possible. And in order to reach that B, which most of you are, it's a total score of 350 to 440, or an IELTS 7 to 7.5. You need to get, as we discussed with purpose, at least two out of three, and five out of seven for all the other criteria that we just went through. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to um, call it a day. Thanks for coming along. I hope that was helpful. This video will go up into the platform very soon. Um, and if you have any further questions, you can join the live classes. I suggest doing that. You know, join the live classes. There's one coming up in about two hours. Um, um, ask your teachers there. They'll know the answers. And keep practicing. Good luck. See you soon.